Hi there, and welcome to Glenkirk Church's live stream. Pastor Tim Peck here. About a year ago, a Glenkirk member asked me to consider doing a series on the Holy Spirit. And as I prayed about this during a three-day silent retreat, God confirmed this direction. So I started thinking about which part of the Bible to focus on for the series. My first thought was the book of Acts with all of its stories of miracles and signs and wonders. But again and again, God kept leading me to the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Never really thought about Romans 8 as it relates to the Holy Spirit before. But as I studied this chapter, I saw that Paul mentions the Spirit 21 different times in this chapter. As Bible teacher John Stott says, Romans 8 teaches us that without the Spirit, discipleship is impossible. 
So I want to invite you to this live stream to watch our summer sermon series, Life in the Spirit. We're going to see during the summer how the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual freedom, empowers us to obey God, enables us to pray effectively, and sustains our hope in a broken world. So I hope you'll join us on this live stream, Life in the Spirit. God bless you. Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Good morning, kids choir. Good morning. It's good to see that you'll hear from them a little bit later in this service. Would you stand with us wherever you are? Let's stand together. I want to welcome those who are at home also and on the patio. Glad that you have joined us today as we praise God together on this beautiful summer day. Let's worship him this morning. you 
give life an eternal spark. I call you healer. You can mend any broken heart. I call you faithful father. You finish everything you start. My soul was made to respond. I know you by a thousand names And you deserve every single one You've given me a million ways To be amazed at what you've done And I am lost in wonder At all you do I know you by a thousand names And I'll sing them back to you Your love is boundless Beyond what I could dream Your grace is patient You're never giving up on me I call you bondage breaker Because you're handing out the prison keys My soul was made To be free You deserve every single one. You've given me a million ways to be amazed at what you've done. And I am lost in wonder at all you do. I know you by a thousand names, and I sing them back to you. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty 
and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king above all kings who is the nation with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. Take my place that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Your voice said thunder, the oaks start twisting, the forest sounds with cedars breaking. You'll want to see you and start there writing from the depths a song is rising. Rising from the ground Holy, 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 holy Lord The earth is yours And singing holy, 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 holy Lord 
The ground is shaking The mighty mountains now are trembling Creation sees you And starts composing Fields and trees they start rejoicing And now it's rising from the This time we get to hear from the kids' choir.
dismissed. And all kids up through fifth grade, you can head out to Sunday school. God bless you as you go. Everybody else, would you take a minute, just turn around, look at some people around you, say hi this morning, welcome some people. Well, I thought we were going to have a wardrobe malfunction there in a second. Um, so, like, cover your eyes. Good morning, Glenkirk family. Um, we're happy to have all of you guys here this morning, um, whether you're worshiping here in person, out on the patio. Um, we'd love to hear from you on our connection cards in the bulletin. Just rip off that little slip, or you can go online and access that connection card as well. Submit your prayers on the back. We do have a prayer team that prays, prays for, through those prayer requests every week. Um, Glen Kirk, brick by brick, VBS registration and wait list is completely full. Uh, but we do still need at least six adult group leaders um, to meet the needs of the children registered. So please uh, visit the website, glenkirkchurch.org uh, forward slash VBS to register as a volunteer. And if you have questions about volunteer needs, uh, please feel free to contact Amber Flores, who is the director of our children's ministries. Uh, if you have not been live scanned, we are offering a free live scan uh, service uh, between the services today. And this service is only for those working with children or on campus during VBS. So that's between the services. Please go to the Kidmen pass-through and uh, bring your driver's license to complete the scan. Our special congregational meeting uh, called by session to vote on uh, calling Reverend Nunley to be our associate pastor will start at 1215 today. So please make sure you come back for that. Uh, Covenant partners, please check in at the lobby to receive your paper ballot. And the meeting will include the APNC's report, an opportunity to hear from Reverend Nunley followed by voting. Um, please make every effort to attend. So stick around for that first service, people. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you all the honor, praise, and glory, for you alone are worthy. We worship you alone, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the discernment you gave to the Associate Pastor Nominating Committee to bring us to this day with a nominee to be heard and voted on. Bless Reverend Kate as she brings a message from your word this morning. Lord, we lift up those who are struggling this morning with pain or heartache or hard decisions. Send healing and comfort and guidance. Father, minister to their hearts and souls. You are the only one who knows our needs and our very selves intimately. Psalm 139, for you created my inmost parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I am awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my formless substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious are your thoughts for me, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're uh, worshiping through giving this morning, uh, this is the time for us to give thanks for who God is as we steward his gifts to us. You can give by going to glenkirkchurch.org forward slash give or using our text to give phone number, which is on the screen. And online giving is also available on the Glenkirk app. And if you're here in person, you can always drop an envelope into the little slot in the drop boxes by the lobby doors on the patio. of every blessing 
to my heart to sing thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mount i'm fixed upon it mount to god's unchanging love here i raise my ebenezer hither by thy help i've come And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger to post his precious blood to grace how great a day daily i'm constrained to be let thy grace now like a fader guide my wandering heart to lead born to wonder lord i feel Born to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it Seal it for thy courts above Born to wonder, Lord, I feel it Born to leave the God I love my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. The Associate Pastor Nominating Committee is excited to announce Reverend Kate Wallace Nunley as its nominee to become Glenn Kirk's next Associate Pastor. She has five years of pastoral experience and is a sought-after conference speaker and has spoken in chapel at numerous Christian universities. This last week, Kate has been able to meet with Glen Kirk staff, senior leadership team, and members of session. And yesterday, we hosted a meet and greet for any Glen Kirk members who wanted to meet Kate and her husband, Lee. And at all the meetings, people had the opportunity to ask Kate questions, and Kate was able to ask some questions of her own in return. Kate is a genuine and humble person who cares deeply about discipleship within the church and has a passion to see congregations grow in the Lord with one another and within the community. She truly wants to see the body of Christ become what God intended it to be. She is passionate about many other things, but I want you to get to know her so she can share about those things herself. Would you please welcome Reverend Kate Wallace Nunley.
Well, hello, Glen Kirk. <laughs> well, my name is Kate. I'm excited to be here with you all. Uh, ever since I was made aware that Glen Kirk was looking for an associate pastor, I've been praying for you all. And um, through this process of interviewing for the position, I too have been in a process of discernment, wondering what it is God might be calling me to, uh, God might be doing in this season. And I've been incredibly impressed with your associate pastor nominating committee. And going through this process as a candidate has been challenging and honoring. And they've made really well known that this position, the hiring of this position, is very important to this church. So with that in mind, I just want to begin by saying thank you. Thank you for having me with you this morning. Thank you for having me as your candidate for associate pastor. It's an honor to be considered. I am joined this morning by my mom, Gail, and my husband, Leif. Uh, we've been married for six years, and Leif and I have a son named Jonathan, who will be three in October. And our son, Jonathan, absolutely loves it when we read books to him. And every few weeks or so, he picks a new favorite book that he insists on reading over and over again. And a few months ago, he found a new book that was his new favorite book, and it's called You Go First. It's actually a book from my childhood. I don't know if many of you remember the Little Critter books. But I was ecstatic that he found this new book to like. Not only because it gave me a break from Fuzzy Yellow Ducklings and Llama Llama, <laughs> but because it's a book with a great message. It's a book um, about this main character, Little Critter. And in the story, he goes about uh, getting frustrated at home, that he can't go first, getting the first pancake or trying the new swing. So he becomes obsessed with going first at school and with his friends. And he starts pushing people out of the way and cutting in line and saying over and over, I go first, I go first. Predictably, this behavior makes his friends mad at him, and he realizes that not everything is about him, and the book ends in changed behavior with him saying, you go first, you go first. So there I was, feeling so proud that this was the book that my son had chosen to be his favorite book. What good parents we were. What good son we were raising that he wanted to read a book about letting other people go first. And then one day, Jonathan woke up, and as was normal, he asked to read his new favorite book. And after reading it three or four times, he looked at me in his pretty blue eyes and smiled and said, I go first, and then ran out of the room. <laughs> I sat there confused for a few moments thinking, surely my son, surely my son did not miss the point of his new favorite book. But sure enough, for the rest of the morning, he continued to say, I go first at breakfast and on our morning walk. And I was humbled in my parenting skills, <laughs> knowing that although my son did indeed love this book, although he knew it was a good book to choose, although he knew that he should imitate the behavior in this book, my son had, in fact, missed the main point of his favorite book, that you go first is better than I go first. You go first is better than I go first. I don't think Jonathan's alone in making that mistake. I know I, too, sometimes forget that you go first is better than I go first. I know sometimes I am disappointed when others are ahead of me. Sometimes I am discontent with my place in traffic or in line. Sometimes I insist on getting my way. Sometimes I forget that you go first is better than I go first. And I would venture to guess that I'm not the only one. I would think at some point most of us forget that very important truth. And we might not be concerned with the same things that a two-year-old is concerned with, Perhaps we say, I go first, when it comes to our free time, or our finances, or arguments with our friends, or roommates, or family. Yeah, I think most of us at some point fall into the trap of I go first. 
And like my son missing the main point of his favorite book, we too forget that you go first is better than I go first. This morning we'll be looking at a passage from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. And this passage reminds us that this problem of I go first, this has been something that, that Jesus followers have struggled with for a really, really long time. So if you are able, please stand for the reading of the word this morning from Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 35. Hear the word of the Lord. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, what is it you want me to do for you? Jesus replied. They replied, let us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong for those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So Jesus and his disciples are traveling on their way to Jerusalem, and two of the disciples come up to him with this request. They ask if they can sit at his right and left hand in his glory. In other words, when Jesus' kingdom is fully established, when his authority is recognized on earth, could they have positions of power and authority along with him? When Jesus is king, could they have positions of power and influence in his government? And Jesus chastises them for this request. And he makes this veiled reference to the violent death he's about to endure. And he asks them if they could do what he's about to do. And ignorantly, they say, yes, enthusiastically, yes, we can. And it seems like their enthusiasm softens Jesus. For surely he knows that as his followers in the coming years, they will indeed endure such hardships. And so he says, yes, you will drink from this cup. But those seats, those aren't mine to give. So he tells them this, and James and John are perhaps confused. I wish it recorded what their response was, but we can only imagine. Now, James and John aren't random people. James and John are brothers. They're sons of a man named Zebedee. They're a family of fishermen who make their living by fishing on the Sea of Galilee. And in Mark chapter 1, we learn that James and John are among the very first disciples of Jesus. In fact, they are called on day one. They've been there from the beginning, faithfully walking away from their old lives to follow Jesus for years. So they're not random people making a crazy request. These disciples are faithful and loyal and long-suffering They're people of faith and courage and conviction, believing Jesus when he says that he's the Messiah, believing that his kingdom is going to be established, and putting everything on the line to follow him. They're in the in crowd. They're in Jesus' inner circle. Only Simon, Peter, and Andrew have walked with Jesus for as long, and someone's got to fill those seats, right? So why not them? Surely, if anyone was going to be considered for high positions of authority in Jesus' kingdom, they would be in the running. So although this request is bold, it's not really out of left field. In many respects, they should be considered. So what did they get wrong? 
To answer this question, we need a little bit more context. Uh, the four books of our Bible, as many of you know, that tell the story of the life, teachings, death, and resurrection of Jesus are called the Gospels. They're Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This story that we're reading this morning occurs in two of those four books, here in Mark 10 and again in Matthew chapter 20. And in both Matthew and Mark, the context of this helps us to understand a little bit better what's going on here. So first we'll look at the context in Mark 10. Uh, earlier in Mark chapter 10, we see the disciples keeping the children away from Jesus, trying not to let them disturb what Jesus is doing in his teaching. And Jesus says, let the children come to me. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. And then after that, Jesus is approached by a rich young ruler who asks what he must do to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus tells him to go and sell all he has and the ruler walks away sad. And Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Just after that, Jesus says, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Then we see him predicting his death and then James and John make this request. The context is very similar in the book of Matthew. We see the same story the disciples keeping the children away from Jesus, and Jesus saying, let the children come. The kingdom of God belongs to them. He repeats the story about the rich young ruler, and the same thing is said. Then he says again, the first will be last, the last will be first. Then there's an extra parable in Matthew about workers in a vineyard, and we'll come back to that. Then Jesus repeats again, the last will be first, the first will be last. Then he predicts his death. And then is this request in the book of Matthew is brought by James and John's mother. So there seems to be a similar theme and sequence in both Mark and Matthew. And all of these stories together, all of these accounts of what Jesus went through just before our story, build the lesson for what we are to learn in this one. That in God's kingdom, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And I think that's important. Because it shows us that what we're to learn this morning is not just a one-off. It doesn't just stand alone. It's actually something that we have been building toward as we read through this gospel. In both Matthew and Mark, Jesus claims the kingdom of God is for the children but it's difficult for the prominent in society to even get in. Children who are not prominent in society, who hold no power or wealth, the kingdom is for them. In fact, the kingdom already belongs to them, Jesus says. But those who are prominent in society, those who have much power and authority, they might not even enter it. Now, this would not have been the general thinking of the day. Who gets into God's kingdom? The powerful. Those who have a title. Those who everyone knows who they are. They should surely get in. But Jesus flips the expectation upside down, showing that in this world, those who are prominent and powerful are not automatically favored in God's kingdom. In fact, the powerless, they seem to be favored. The way things work in this world are not the way things work in God's kingdom. The first will be last. The last will be first. And this lesson is underscored in the Gospel of Matthew with this additional parable about the workers in the vineyard. The story goes something like this. There's a landowner who has a field, and he goes out early in the morning to hire some workers and find some, and they agree to work for a full day's wage, a denarius. And he brings them back, and they go out in the field. And then a little later in the, in the morning, he goes out and buys, finds some more workers and, and agrees to pay them whatever is fair, and they come and work as well. About noon, the landowner goes out again, finds some more workers, brings them to his field, they begin working. And again, around five in the evening, he goes out and finds even more workers and brings them, and they work for just an hour. And everything's well and fine until it's time to pay all the workers for their work. And those who came last get paid first. And they get paid, instead of working for only an hour, they get paid for a full day's work. And this is where everything gets a little upset. The gospel reads, 
So when those who came, those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius, a day's wage. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of work and the heat of the day. So they're complaining. How in the world did the people who only worked an hour get paid the same as us? Surely we should get paid more. And the landowner says, hey, this is more than fair. You agreed to work for a full day's wage, and that's what you got. What is it to you if I want to be generous to those who came after you? The world expects those who come first to get more, to be favored. But Jesus flips the expectation upside down. Evidently, that's not how it works in God's kingdom. And just as he did before with the story of the children and then the rich young ruler, he does again and flips this expectation upside down, showing the, things, the way things work in the world are not the way things work in God's kingdom. The first will be last. The last will be first. So that's what we see. Jesus says the little children, the kingdom of God already belongs to them. Those who are prominent in society, well, they might not get in. And then in Matthew, he tells this story about workers in the vineyard who are all paid the same, no matter how many hours they worked. And then in case we miss it, he explicitly says, in God's kingdom, those who are first will be last and last will be first. And then in both Matthew and Mark, this all sets the stage for our story this morning, where James and John come up to Jesus and make their request to sit in these prominent seats of power in his kingdom. So I'll come back to our question, what did they get wrong? Well, let's return to our passage. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. James and John are faithful. They have learned from Jesus. They've walked with Jesus. They've followed him. They think his kingdom is going to be established. But just like my son missed the main point of the story he's heard dozens of times, James and John, too, missed the main point Jesus is trying to teach them. They, too, missed the same major point. They failed to understand that Jesus' kingdom, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. They failed to see the character of this kingdom that Jesus is going to establish. They failed to see this Jesus' kingdom through Jesus' lens. They kept seeing it through their own, understanding how kingdoms work with those at the top lording authority over those below. They failed to see that Jesus was flipping our idea of kingdom, flipping our idea of a power and authority on its head. He was flipping the org chart upside down. And although they had been walking with Jesus and learning from Jesus, although they had been faithful through each account we just looked at, they failed to see that he was revolutionizing our idea of kingdom from I go first to you go first. And perhaps they thought they could hold positions of authority in Jesus' kingdom because his kingdom would be like any other, with those at the top exercising authority over those below. Or perhaps they thought they could have positions of authority in Jesus' kingdom because, like the workers in the parable, they were there first. They've put in all the hard work. They've been there through it all. But whatever their reasoning if Jesus, the king himself, came not to be served but to serve, if Jesus, the king himself, came not to exercise authority over people but give his life for them, if Jesus, the king himself, came not to claim his rightful place but willingly give it up, then this is where they miss the mark. This is where they get it wrong. They ask for seats of power and prominence in a kingdom that's built upon self-sacrifice. 
They ask for the I go first in a kingdom that's all about you go first. You want to sit at Jesus' right and left hands? Then take a knee. Pick up a towel. Serve those you think you should have authority over. Give your life for them because that's what Jesus did. And that's what we are called to do. Philippians 2 is perhaps the best picture of a summary of Christian living. And it gives us a great picture of what this might look like for us to say, you go first instead of I go first. Let's look at just a little bit of this together. Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing of the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross." Philippians 2 colors in the picture that Jesus draws for us about what it looks like, what this kingdom of God is going to look like. What does it look like for the first to be last and the last to be first? What does it look like to serve rather than being served? What does it look like to say you go first instead of I go first? In your relationships with one another, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of vain conceit. Be humble. Value others above yourself. Be like Jesus. Take the form of a servant. This is what our behavior should look like as we interact with each other at church and in community, in our families, in our friendships, on social media, in everyday interactions with strangers and people we know, with those we agree with and those we do not. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Nothing out of vain conceit. Be humble. Value the other above yourself. Be like Jesus. Take the form of a servant. That is you go first. James and John got it wrong because they wanted power and privilege instead of humility and service. They asked for the I go first in a kingdom that's all about you go first. So what about us? It's easy, perhaps, for us on this side to look at this story and think, wow, they really got it wrong. (laughs) Because we know what Jesus is about to go and do. We know that Jesus came to give his life. We, We see the whole story. We have that privilege. But I think we as Christ followers often fall into the same pattern. I think we often forget the kingdom of God doesn't look like the kingdoms of this world, that the kingdom of God doesn't favor those who got there first or work the hardest or yell the loudest or have the most power. I think we as Christ followers often forget that in God's kingdom that it was established here on earth not through God's dominance over people, but through God's death. I think we often forget that the powers of the world, the powers of sin and death that held humanity captive were defeated not by Jesus invading the earth with the power and army of heaven, but with Jesus' self-sacrifice and love. I think we often forget there is real life-transforming, kingdom of God-building power in you go first. And we forget because like James and John, that's just not how our world works. Like James and John, our world, we see those who put themselves first often come first. Those who have power and privilege often are favored. In our our world's kingdoms, those on top do exercise authority over those below. And even for those of us who follow Jesus for a long time, we, like James and John, can fall into this mistake. And 
And I think we do this in two main ways as Christians. And there are lots of other ones, but I think one of the ways we do this is through how we think the church should be structured. Uh, In many different churches around the world, they think that the church should look like businesses and organizations with the pastors at the top wielding all the authority, making all the decisions, and letting everyone else know what's going to go on. It's one of the things I admire most about the Presbyterian polity. That's not how it works here. (laughs) The congregation, the people, work in mutuality, trying to discern the work of God together with those who may be set aside for certain services, but that's what they are, services. And we work together to, to decipher the will of God for the people. I think that's the biblical model. However it ends up looking in the specifics, we are called as a community of the church to be mutual with each other and to seek God together. I think another way we do this in Christian community, and this one doesn't apply to all of us, but for those who this does apply to, um, I think marriage is another one of those areas. I think sometimes we think that marriage should look like the kingdoms of the world with someone on top telling everyone else, how it's going to go. One spouse too often gets to go first while the other is expected to follow along. Too often marriages look like secular kingdoms. And while I'm not trying to lay out a definitive structure for every marriage to follow, I think that it's important, no matter what we think the biblical setup of marriage to be, that it reflect Jesus and that it reflect Jesus' kingdom. All marriages should reflect this foundational teaching of Jesus that husband to wife and wife to husbands, if our marriages don't reflect, yeah, I know in the world people have authority and they exercise it over each other, but not so with you. If our marriages don't reflect, do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit or in humility, valuing the other above yourself. If our marriages don't reflect serving one another and making ourselves nothing and taking the nature of servants, then if our marriages don't reflect serving rather than being served, then I think we've gotten it wrong. And I think we need to seriously ask ourselves if we, like James and John, have missed something. And relationships are hard. Marriages, friendships, family dynamics, work relationships, relationships are just hard. And I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying this is something I'm currently trying to learn. What does it look like to say you go first? So this week, I'm going to do something. I invite you all to join me. I'm going to take an area of my life, my job, my family, my marriage, my friendship, the the relationship in my family that's just a little harder than the rest of them, And I'm going to ask myself throughout the week, in what ways am I saying I go first instead of you go first in that relationship? In what ways am I seeking to be served rather than to serve? I invite you all to join me in that. I hope you do. So like my two-year-old, James and John missed this fundamental aspect of Jesus' kingdom that you go first is better than I go first. And they aren't the only ones, are they? (laughs) Too often we all fall into that trap of forgetting that I go first, that you go first is better than I go first. We, We adopt that I go first attitude in the you go first God kingdom. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. So Glenkirk Church In the world, people exercise authority over others, not so with you. In the world, those with political and social power lord it over others, not so with you. In the world, the powerful and influential are favored, not so with you. In the world, systems of power and authority rule communities and families and marriages, not so with you. In the world, people insist on their own way, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
May we be people who don't miss this foundational truth of the kingdom of God. May we be people who remember that you go first is better than I go first. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for the way that it shows us what you have called us to be and to do. Help us this week. Help us as we strive to live out the you go first kingdom of God. Be with us, Holy Spirit, this week as we evaluate our lives. We invite you in to reform us and remake us, to show us your ways. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Kate. As I read the sermon for this week and Kate shared some of her thoughts, I was um, thinking about this song. And this song is a song that I learned when I was in kids' choir. And I was the age that my kids were up here this morning. Um, and it's something that I think about a lot. And it is a prayer that I think we can all pray this morning. sing along. If not, you can learn it quickly. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be. Make me Stand, let's sing that together one more time. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who meeting. Um, it will start uh, promptly at 1215. If you're a covenant partner, um, please check in to receive your paper ballot. And um, anyone is welcome to come, but only covenant partners, um, which is our word for members of Glenkirk who've gone through the membership process, have voice and vote. But anyone is welcome to come and it'd be 1215. Um, and also we have elders who will be up here on your left um, who would be happy to pray with you. If you're carrying a burden today, if there's an area where you really need help in letting someone else go first, um, we have elders who would be glad to pray with you. And you can either come up during the postlude that Joseph plays or immediately after the postlude. Um, now I invite you to go in this blessing. May the God of peace who came to serve 
fill you with a servant's heart. May others go first in your life as you follow Jesus in your marriage and in your family and in your community and with your friends. And may that be a visible, powerful image of the kingdom of God that draws others to enter in. Go in his love and go in his peace. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you.